this computer. All right. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show. It's been a while, man. We got 134 episodes under our belt. I usually have a really cool co-host that's also a drummer, Jim McCarthy, but he's at his son's basketball game tonight, right? Wah, wah, wah. But uh, anyways, this is a show where we talk about music, motivation, and success. And I'm so excited about our guest today because he is a true journeyman drummer. Started playing drums at the age of eight. Had a gig when he was 12, went pro at 12, and then, hey, look at this list of people that he's worked with. The Vandals, A Perfect Circle, Nine Inch Nails, Devo, Weezer, Offspring, and then fresh off a rehearsal with Sting, our new friend, Josh Fries. How are you, man? All right. I'm great. It's, it's funny. I thought you were going to say, usually we have a really cool guest on the show. <laughs> You're a really cool co-host, okay. Oh, yeah, my co-host is great. He does, like, sound effects and stuff, and he's kind oh, of like man. a hobbyist drummer, which is, you know, he's got a real job. He does voiceovers, like, for a living, and and I'll complain sometimes, like, I couldn't believe catering today had no gluten-free options. And he's like, Rich, shut up, man. I play drums in my basement. Just enjoy yeah, yourself. Right? Yeah, you know? exactly. exactly. It's, good to, it's good to have those guys around, man. But we, we have so many mutual friends, and we're both DW and Remo artists, and I just wanted to talk to you forever, man. So so episode 100 of this show was another hero of mine, Kenny Aronoff. So you're oh, episode yeah. 135, man. Yeah, I've known Kenny a long time. I love Kenny. Yeah, so, well, let's address this elephant in the room, man. We've got to promote your new product. This is your third solo record. Um, yeah. Tell us about it. You know, what's funny is technically, technically it's my fourth. And if you really want to get super weird and no one would know this, but it's kind of my fifth. I made a record, <laughs> I don't even know what year, the late 90s under the name Princess was the wow. name of the artist. And it was me, and it was, it's like an EP, it's like five songs. I think I have like three CDs to my name. It's not, a, it's not available digitally, there's no vinyl. This company, I don't know, printed up like a thousand or 2000 copies and sold them. And uh, so there's the Princess record, which is basically me on my eight track, messing around at home. And then the next record was uh, in 2000, my first like real record, the Notorious One Man Orgy. 2009, I made a, a, an actual record since 1972. And then just after that, I made a little EP for these uh, called My New Friends. The artist was Josh Reason. The album's called My New Friends. And it's ah. called these, four, these four guys that paid to have me write songs about it or release them. <laughs> so the, yeah, there's uh, Eddie, Chuck, uh, Tom, uh, yeah, Thomas, and uh, Ferris. And uh, they all paid to have songs written about them. And so that's a little EP. And now I've done this full length record. Well, you call it full length. It's only 20 minutes long, but it's you know, all these one minute songs that originally was going to be 40 songs, 40 or 50 songs on one album, all 60 seconds, within 60 seconds. Some are 57 seconds, some are a minute, two, but they're all about a minute. And then uh, when we realized we we're going to put them out, uh, the label kind of talked me into doing two different records just for fun, just for doing, you know, the fact we're not printing up any CDs, we're just releasing it digitally and then having vinyl, like a limited edition vinyl for volume one and volume two. But, um, you know, it's an interesting record to me, or they're interesting records to me, aside from being only a minute long and kind of great for my short attention span and everyone else's short attention span out there. Yeah, it's like um, the Instagram world of immediacy. Yeah. I mean, the way this record came about was I wasn't really planning on making a record. I really had no intention of making a record. And uh, and what it was is I was just sort of uh, trying to amuse myself and have some fun when all my work went away, when you couldn't leave your house and when the world was ending and all this, you know, I was like, OK, how am I going to kind of enjoy myself? I can only watch so many episodes of. Everybody loves uh, Raymond. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, my kids, I'm watching Adventure Time and the regular show and SpongeBob and The Office. And like, I'm just watching TV, TV, TV. So I'd have to retreat to the back studio and work on stuff. And without sitting down and going, okay, I've got to write a song and it's got to have all these different parts. And, you know, I said, you know, what? just do write a couple of 60 second songs just for fun, real simple, wasn't much, uh, you know, stress. Uh, you know, and 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 make little videos on my phone to put up on Instagram, literally just to put up for fun, not make a record, not try and make any money. From, I'm still not trying to make any money from it and probably won't. I'm just doing it. Literally, it's a labor of love. And after I'd recorded four or five one minute songs, one of my oldest friends is Stone Gossard from Pearl Jam, who has a record label. 
And Stone called me and said, hey, man, he goes, let's put these out. So let's just do it for fun. Let's put yeah. it out. Let's do a thousand copies of vinyl, put it out digitally and do some crazy artwork. I want it all to be you. You do whatever you want. No guidelines from me. No uh, rules. You know, just have fun. And so, you know, we got to do it. And I, I didn't even have to think twice as much as I wasn't planning on it. I didn't then go, hmm, Stone wants to put my record out. Maybe I should shop it. I mean, I was going to yeah. say shop at the labels, but what labels are there left? You know, everyone should put <laughs> shit out of anyway. So, so, you know, we uh, had fun doing it and the volume two is done and probably going to come out in January, February, but you know, if you don't like the song, it's over before the time you can lean forward and press skip. So it's like, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to swallow and it's all over the place and kind of fun, you know? So it's very fun. It's super power pop. Uh, the record is called uh, just a minute. Volume one it came out October 29th. A couple of the songs, uh, The Dwarves and the Queens, Heavy Metal Car Collection, Learning to Like It, a lot of green screens, animation, actors, I mean, like, like videos, man. Yeah, well, you know, the, some of those videos, the, all the videos you just named, I didn't make. Like originally, I was making fun little videos on my phone. Yeah. And you know what? I want to make videos with a little bit, you know, a little bit more serious or intricate or for real than just me dicking around on my iPhone. So, yeah, I mean, it's great. The Dwarves and the Queens video is great. It's these two sisters from Ukraine that are big punk rock fans. And I met through my brother who plays keyboards at Green Day. And uh, they're Green Day fans. They're Vandals fans. They're big social distortion fans. They're huge social distortion fans. And I had played on a social distortion record. And when I was over there with Sting a couple of years back, my brother said, oh, you got to meet these girls. They're really great. They do this great animation. So I met them and had lunch with them. And when it was time for me to kind of make a couple of videos and hopefully not spend an arm and a leg on them. Yeah. You no, know, I contacted them and said, Hey, you know, I'm happy to pay you. What do you charge? I want you to make a video. It's only a minute long. And they made me that video. I think that video is really great. They did oh, really so they did it for you. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 I hired them. I hired them. Yeah. They did it for me. And then, uh, and then, uh, the two videos that have all the crazy green screen stuff, which is, uh, heavy metal car collection and baby's first beard is a friend of mine named Brian O'Malley who does, just does great work. he's just out there and does great work and so we had fun i mean heavy metal car collection i spent about two hours at his house filming in front of a green screen and he did everything and the great thing about brian is he and i are so similar and like I, what i would do it's almost as if i've done the video but i didn't have to like he just like came up with the stuff and like he sent it to me and he goes what do you think i go I think it's done. I'd like to come back with you with a list of notes because I mean, man, you read my mind. It's great. It's exactly how I'd want it to look. And same with uh, this other song, "Baby's First Beer" that he did, and uh, and then learning to like it. My friend Paz Lynch on ten, who played bass with me in a perfect circle, and uh, she plays bass in the Pixies now. She does this kind of stop stop motion photography stuff, and hired uh, this great. Uh, graffiti artist that goes by the name muck rock her name's jules muck and uh she did all this uh, all the spray painting graffiti stuff and then pause filmed the stop motion stuff with our friend hannah is in it and uh yeah i just have called on a few friends to like you know i can't call in too many favors you know yeah. but someone here will help me with this and someone there will help me with this and kind of i got to get a lot of stuff done quickly and i'm still going to work on stuff i've been really busy lately juggling stuff between sting and stuff with the offspring. So it's like, you know, and having four children. So it's kind of, I'm really busy. So yeah. it was uh, great to be able to farm out some of this work and not try and just do these videos on my own. Yeah. But uh, because they're only a minute long, they're fun to do. And, you know, because there's no rules and we're not trying to get it on MTV or trying to get a plate somewhere. <laughs> we're just doing it for the fuck of it, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the best kind of stuff anyways, you know? I think it's amazing to have a creative out like that, you know, because you're, yeah, you know, you're a work. I mean, you've been in bands, but like the Vandals, I don't even know if you're a full a member, like on paper or how that works or with Devo, you know, but I mean, I'm a side man. I've been a side man my entire life. I know that works. I have to have some other creative outlets for your soul because you're always taking direction from people right. yeah. fresh off a rehearsal with sting. How does that work? I mean, you are, you're emulating the parts of one of your favorite drummers. I think you've called him the Hal Blaine of the eighties or who was he? You, you called him like a, Oh, Stuart. Yeah. The Steve Gadd I mean, of the eighties. Or I, I think he's sort of like the John Bonham of the, the John Bonham of the eighties. In the way that such a unique voice that launched I, just millions of drummers to try and emulate that style. And it's like, you know, you mentioned Steve Gadd. It's funny when I was growing up playing drums, 
friends of mine at school only knew drummers that you would see on MTV or only drummers that played in really famous rock bands. So they'd go, hey, uh, my brother told me that Neil Peart's the best drummer that ever lived. You know, he's the best drummer in the world. <laughs> and I like Neil's drumming a lot. You know, I mean, there's, there's no denying the mark that he made on drumming and, and rock and roll and music in general. Uh, but already I was listening to Vinny and I was listening to Gad and I was listening to Peter Erskine. And so it would piss me off when I'd hear like, because I was like, man, these guys will never know about Steve Gad. These, never, these guys are never going to know about Vinny Caliuta, these, these, these stoner kids from my high school. So I kind of like had a chip on my shoulder about that sort of stuff. And, and Steve Gadd, or the thing about Stewart that it, that was great about him and like John Bottoms, they played in these bands that were really popular. You know, they were, they were, they were selling millions and millions of, rock, of records. They were rock stars, but Bottom had such unique style and, and, and such a presence in that band that still to this day, people, try and play like him people reference his groove people reference his drum sound we're going for a bottom thing here you know how many times i've heard that in the studio every day and you know, <laughs> and you know exactly what i mean you know yeah um it's, and the thing is same with stewart so people can go yeah we're going for like a stewart cope think stewart copeland and they might be talking about the style or they might be talking about just the drum sound they might be talking about the hi-hat work they might be talking about the snare sound they may be talking about the uh urgency the, atti the attitude yeah so you're like to me they got to blanket so much, cover so much ground in popular music because they, they were all over MTV, you know? But here he is doing this great stuff that all these other great drummers, unfortunately, weren't being heard on that scale because they yeah. weren't popular rock groups, right? Yeah. So he was such a unique voice. And like I say, like, if, if John Bonham was, uh, you know, the voice of drums in the 70s for inspiring drummers, Stuart on a large scale was that unique popular music drummer that kind of still to this day inspires and, and people, you know, try and emulate, you know, I know your gateway drug to music was probably, I, I did a little research on Devo or um, Basio, the missing person stuff. For me, it was like 1983 synchronicity was like, I said, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And thank yeah. God I had supportive parents like you, you know, your dad directed the bands out yeah. at Disneyland. Did you yeah. ever like your dad being a kind of like a jazzer? Was that ever kind of like, you know, because you went the uh, well, you played with uh, Buble, right? And some other. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, I mean, the stuff I've done with Michael Buble is like so I was talking about it earlier today. Some of my favorite stuff I played on one of my favorite because people will sometimes will ask me, what are your favorite songs you played on? And that's a hard. That's a really hard, hard one. answer, you know, because I play on a lot of stuff. A lot of it I like. Uh, a lot of it I'm not super keen on, but, but, you know, there's certain things that stick out for me. And one track I'm really proud of because the song is a great song. It sounds great. And I'm proud of my playing on it. The overall feel is the Buble song, Just Haven't Met You Yet, was which I think it might have been his biggest hit, you know? Man. So for me to be able to walk around a grocery store or the airport and hear it and go, God, this is so great. It was such a massive song, you know? Yeah. And whenever it comes on the radio or if it comes on the car, just those opening chords, of the piano, the bow, bow, bum, bow, down, 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 and the shuffle, just, I really love it. I think it's, I'm really proud of that moment. And, uh, and when, when someone picks a song like that, that I've recorded to be a single, then it does well. I'm really happy because it's not, all the time that that happens. It's not often, to be honest. Um, similar to the first and probably the biggest single that A Perfect Circle ever had, the song Judith. Like, I love the drums on that song. It's yeah. one of my favorite things that I've ever recorded. So for the fact that the fact that it was heard a lot, yeah. I'm really happy about that because that, that one is also a really special, those two of those are probably my top five. I can't, I couldn't name you the other three right now, but those are definitely two of the four runners. If someone said, what are you proud of? What do you really love that you've done? I'd go, this song I love. Okay. And also the song, it's not just the drumming. It's not like hey, it's a happy know, song. It's positive. It's yeah. yeah. And, and the perfect circle song is dark and aggressive and dynamic yeah. and, and, and there's peaks and valleys. And I, I'm really proud of that one as well. And then you yeah. couldn't escape the Evanescence. You couldn't escape the Daughtry. I mean, it's like, I'm in a CVS or a, you know, Ralph's and right. It's, I mean, that, that, that doesn't get old, right? Hearing yourself no. on the radio or the supermarket. No, not at all. Not yeah. at all. It's, it's, it's always fun to hear. I'll tell you the funny thing about the Daughtry thing. I got a funny, quick Daughtry story. Because Chris moved here to Nashville. I'm in Nashville right now. So. Oh, yeah? Oh, in, cool, cool. The, so I was out to lunch with my mom at a mall in, in Orange, South Orange County called South Coast Plaza. 
Yeah. Right. It's like the pool mall in Costa Mesa, Newport Beach area. Yeah, I like it. And uh we're having lunch there and for like Mother's Day or something. And uh and and I remember going in the restroom at the we were at this nice restaurant there, and I go in the restroom and I'm sitting there and I'm like taking a leak and like zoning out, and I hear the song. I'm kind of listening to it. I'm like, I didn't even recognize it, to be honest. It's not like, where do I know this song from? I'm just listening to it. And I'm like, God, I've played on so many things like this. I've played on so much stuff like this. And a lot of it, I don't remember that well. And a lot of it, I couldn't tell you the names of it, uh, of certain songs. And I'm listening and it gets to the chorus because everyone's going, dude, I heard that song you played on. And I'd never really heard it on the radio. I recorded it years ago, but it was the his big single, Home. But I didn't, I didn't recognize it until I got out of the chorus. So yeah. I said, they're taking a leak on. I'm like, listen, this thing going, God, I've done on so many things like this. I wonder what, who this is. And it gets the chorus. I'm like, oh, this is me. That it's is me. <laughs> well, you, you know, know, what's so funny is that, is that uh, that record was like um, kind of forbearing, like that's country now. There, I mean, you played acrostic yeah. and verse. Well, so, I mean, that is, that's what's happening in Nashville. Except we can't get away with all the, 30 second notes like where it's, we, we get our wrist slapped for that stuff it's like uh, yeah, it's yeah. hard like you know i talk to students i say you know this is like a homogenation of of the genre i'm like you're every genre is god of vernacular you have to learn to speak that language and you uh -huh. learn what's going to get your wrist like you can get away with that when you're riding the crash and it's a huge top 40 rock song but a lot of times you're just going to get your you got to do black gakas gaka gakas and to get uh -huh. the check in nashville you know sure, sure. yeah i uh I was talking about country. I, uh, and I, I, I'm embarrassed to say, I couldn't tell you the name of the, the, the record or the songs, but, and maybe it never came out or maybe they re redid my tracks. But I, I, I did three or four songs with Rascal Flatts about five, six years ago. Oh, cool. Was it like Dan Huff? Was it with Dan Huff? Producing? Oh, it was, it was with Howard Benson. Oh, there. Okay. Yeah. Howard did it. And we were out at sunset sound and, uh, yeah, it's probably like six, seven years ago. Yeah. Uh, and they were really cool guys. They were really nice dudes and great players. Yeah. You know? But it I was recorded um, in that that room, that, the Van Halen room. I forget which room that is, but that's Studio Three. That was a that was a pinch me moment. I was like, dude, this is where all the beer cans are all crushed on the floor, and they're like it's malt liquor, man. <laughs> malt liquor, yes. Yeah, it's yeah. malt liquor cans. Yeah. Oh, I mean, and yeah, I mean, you've recorded there a million times, right? Back when it was yeah. a yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's special because, yeah, I'm such a fan of those Van Halen records. You know, yes. those original Van Halen records to me are so great still, you know. Yeah, man. Well, and I love the, the Paul Westerberg stuff. And I love the story of how you were about to catch a flight one time and they're like, hey, play this. And he didn't even want you to like, because the funny thing is, is that a lot of drummers would have been a precious and they would say, just take the three and a half minutes and show me the structure. I'll write a chart and I'll nail it. And you were like, I'm just going to jump on the thing here and do this. That's actually happened twice with Paul. And I know that that's part of his spirit. And I like the fact that, hey, if he's, I mean, we're going to do it. And if it sucks, we, it's not like this, it's not like I'm not going like, to, I'm not going to let you hear the song, but we only have one chance to, to track it. It's like, yeah, we were able to track it a couple of times, uh, but he's so funny. He's like a, because I know it's not Mahavishnu Orchestra or the Chick Corea Electric Band, right. it's going to be in 4-4, four, four, you know what I mean? And it's going to probably be even chunks of, if it ain't an 8-bar intro, it's a 16-bar intro. If it's not a 16-bar verse, it's going to be an 8-bar verse. And I'm just watching him. Right. And I can tell when he's like at the end of an 8-bar phrase of these chords going, it means we're either going to the pre-chorus or the chorus. I'm probably either going to open up the hi-hats or I'm going to switch the ride symbol, but we're not going to change time signatures. Right. You know, it, it, as far as I know, unless he goes like this, I'm not, there's no rests. You know, we're just playing through the song and it's rock and roll and it's three minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that happened twice. The, the first time was the first time I worked with him in late 92 in San Francisco. I went up to record them at the tail end of him making his first solo record. He'd used a few different drummers I never met him before. I was a huge fan. And my friend Matt Wallace that was producing it called me and said, hey, we've got one more song to track. And the guy that he thought was going to be his drummer and was recording with us a lot, it's not really working out. So now's your chance, kid. And I was 19 and I flew up to San Francisco. And I was like, oh my God. So I went up and I did this song that ended up being on like 
B-sides and like best of records or whatever, but it didn't end up on the album. It's a song called Seeing Her. But what happened is the next day I was flying home and I purposefully left my symbols at the studio. Almost like some girl that like purposely left, leaves her, her earrings at the guy's house. So she, oh, do I have to come back the next day to get my hair? <laughs> you know? I was such a Westerberg fan. I'm like, I want to come back tomorrow and get my symbols. Um, so I went back to the hotel. Hey, I'm going to come back tomorrow and grab my symbols. Like, okay, cool. So I came back to grab my symbols. And that's when I'm like, hey, uh, what time's your flight? And I'm like, well, it's in an hour or two. But I mean, I can change it. They're going back every, every hour and a half from San Francisco to LA, right? So Matt was mixing the record and they were, they were done with the record, right? But Paul's in the corner, like sitting down with his legs crossed and a notepad and his guitar is like, here, just jump on the drums real quick. Let's, let's play this thing. I'm yeah, like, yeah. Uh, okay. He's like, just, just it's like, boom, dude, it's like this. Okay. Simple enough. Right. Right. Yeah. Even the drums, I'm just kind of watching him, you know, I'm watching him and, uh, I don't know if it was in one take. It might have, we might have done it a couple of times. We just did it. There was no demo to play me. He was like working the chords out. We recorded just like twice, just drums and guitar. But Maybe that's so of, honest. No click. I said, count no, it no, off. No, fuck that. No click. None you of know, that stuff. Just, it, ended being, it ended up being his one single from that album. And great. maybe, arguably enough, maybe the coolest song on the record is a song called World Class Fad. Heck yeah. Uh, he made a big video for it. The whole thing is great song. And then a similar thing happened when I went to work with him on his, not his second, his third solo record. Uh, I was on tour in Europe with the Vandals and he was recording some stuff with Keltner. And I think Abe played on a few things. And they said, man, on your way back from Europe, can you, we're in New York, can you stop in New York and record a few things? Sure. So I went, Don Was was producing and there was this big fancy New York studio and Don Was is producing and, and same thing. So there's this big budget album, but Paul's like, just I'm sitting behind the drums, kind of like getting sound sort of. He comes out, puts headphones on. Don kind of comes out when puts the bass on. And I'm like, let's check out the track. They're like, no, 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 no. It's like, it's like this. Just let's just fucking around. You know, just play. You know, just here, just count us. And same thing. Just okay. I'm 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 assuming the intro is not seven bars or eleven bars or 14 and a half bars. It's probably eight or maybe four. But well, it sucks when it's four yeah. and, and yeah. he does eight and you go to tighten the hi-hat and you're like, oops. Yeah. And then the phrase, I'm like, okay, we're, okay, we're going to the verse now. Cool. Yeah. We mm -hmm. run it and he'll be like, maybe at the end of eight bars, he's like playing. He's like, oh, uh, not yet. You know, okay, I'm staying. 16, at the end of the four bar phrase, all right, fill into the court, you know, and it was real yeah. easy. And it's a song called, but that specific one that I remember tracking like that was a song called uh, Looking, at, Looking Out Forever. And it's a cool song. It's on that record on Capitol Records. And yeah, that was the one, both of those I'd never heard. And he's like, just, here, just play it, man. I'm like, okay, I'll play along with you. And if we get it, cool. But yeah, you know. Well, that's, I, I feel like you're like a, like a, I don't even know if you're into this kind of stuff, but you're like a master manifester. You were a fan of Devo. You got the gig with Devo. You're a fan of the replacements. You got a gig with Paul Westerberg. You're a fan of Sting. Dude, it's like, it just goes to show that these people are, um, they poop and pay taxes. And, you know, it's like some, some guy like in that's in Fargo, North Dakota. It's like, I want to make a, a living in the music business. How can I do this? Well, it's all about people. And you were able to connect with these people, but somehow like through the universe, yeah. I mean, I think it helps to live in Southern California. It's a, such a cultural place. It doesn't hurt. The fact that you I know. yeah wasn't in the middle of nowhere in the woods somewhere up in Canada, or, you know, but I mean, yeah, that's amazing. No. That's a law of attraction, man. Really yeah, is. I mean, yeah, I mean, my parents said that all the time. They're like, I remember you being down in the basement practicing the Devo albums all day and, you know, and and, go, and and buying replacements records when you're in junior high. And and those to me are my two kind of favorite gigs I've had because of that reason alone. And as much as I liked the police a lot growing up and like Stuart Copeland, I became a fan kind of consistently. I didn't like there was certain bands I kind of od on when I was little and really love, 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 love Redevo being one and the replacements being one. The police I always liked. I always liked them and I always liked Stuart Copeland, but it stayed consistent. And kind of as I got older, I started even appreciating it more and more. And looking back on it, I go, God, those records. I mean, all the records that the, the police made are great. And all the truth, there's not one 
to me, there's not one album you could pick and go, well, that's the best record or that's the best Stuart tracks. They're all fucking great. And I love that older stuff like So Lonely, Born in the 50s, that, you know, the earlier stuff that was rough around the edges, you know. Yeah. I mean, they go through Regatta de Blanc and Zenyatta Mandata and Ghost of the Machine. I mean, there's a synchronicity. They're fucking, they're so good. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, but for me, and in a weird underground way, the Devo and the replacements thing was really what kind of like struck a big weird chord with me at a young age, you know? Yeah. And uh, but I'll tell you, you know, it's, it's, I, I'd be lying if I didn't enjoy myself being up there playing, you know, message in a bottle and oh the pain every night fuck it's so cool incredible yeah. that has alongside, to be incredible alongside the guy that wrote them and singing them and dominic miller playing it it's just, it's just fantastic you know yeah well you know what's so crazy is that uh, you have been on my radar for decades because i um i did the more there's two approaches to this music business thing it was like um you know i went to north texas state i got the masters oh, cool. i played in the one o'clock lab did you, and when did you go there um, I was there uh, 93 to 95, and I studied with Ron Fink, whose daughter you dated. I was about to, that was the next thing on my tip of my tongue. Was like, did you know Ron Fink? So Ron Fink was my timpani, mallets, and snare drum teacher, and he's like, my daughter's dating this rock and roller, played this guy named uh, Paul Westerberg. And then I think, mm -hmm. did she marry Mr. McDreamy, the yeah. actor? Yeah, she's married to Patrick Dempsey and they've got three kids. Oh my God. Yeah. That's yeah, Patrick Dempsey's wife, Jillian. Uh, Jill. Um, Jill and I are still buddies. She's cool. She's super cool. Well, she's you guys were cool. young. I mean, that you yeah. had to be like what? Like in well, late? I was I started dating Jill when I was like 19 going on 20. Yeah. Until I was about 24. Yeah. And she was like eight, nine years older than me. So it was a big deal. I was like 20, she was like 28, which when you get older, older, it's not a big deal. But nice, man. She's nearing 30 and I couldn't even technically get into a bar to have a beer. It was cool and it was kind of weird. And, you know, there's a big, you know, and it got to the point where it's like, I was still kind of a kid and she's like, oh, I'm ready to start a family or something. And so, you know, we, we remained as good of friends as you can in a breakup. It's never easy. That stuff's never easy. But um, yeah, Jill's great. And uh, it's so funny, man. Yeah, Ron, I mean, he would come to gigs once in a while and I always be like, oh God, he probably thinks this is horrible. Like she'd bring him to, he'd be visiting out in LA. She'd take him to a gig. I'm like, oh, he probably thinks I'm the biggest like dumbass caveman rock drummer. And, uh, and, and, and we'd go, you know, I've been to his house in Denton, Texas. Yeah, man. And Crazy. I haven't seen him in years, you know, years and years, but that's so, I was, I was on the tip of my tongue. I was going to say, you know, Ron, that, that, that means exact, that's the exact time period. Yeah. I remember that forever. And then just kind of watched your career kind of unfold from there. Yeah. So, so I was going to say like two ways to, to go about like this academic, like I, I have, like, I tell people I'm an overeducated rock drummer because my first, you know, entrance to music was uh, Elton John's greatest hits volume one on eight track. Right. So that's the kind of direction I wanted to go, but it's like, no kid, you got to learn how to play, you know, uh, xylophone and yeah, like, no, we want to rock. I know, but I just, I jumped through the hoops, you know, well, I did. Good. You know, you it's, know. it's good to be well-versed man yeah. and well rounded and all that stuff. You know, I think that's, that only makes you a better musician no matter what. Yeah. Well, I know time is time is flying. Uh, I don't know if you have any advice, you know, because I get a mixed bag of people that watch this show is everyone from like country music fans that are driving their big rigs down the highway all the way to like guys that are trying to make it as drummers. What would be the career advice? Would you any kind of insights you would give to somebody that's like 16 in their bedroom and they got a poster of you on their wall and they want to do the thing? I remember Frank Zappa used to say, go get a real estate license. <laughs> Especially in Southern California, the <laughs> that was yeah. advice to young composers. Sure. Uh, you know, I say uh, find what you like first of all. You know, whatever you're naturally gravitating towards, and and get into it. You know what I mean? I mean, really, like you know, focus and 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 study, listen. Uh, I think playing with as many people as you can is great. Um, and while you're getting out there and just playing with as many people as you can and being in, in, and kind of uh, involve yourself in whatever situations you can, keep in mind, aside from playing, you've got to be able to 
be be cool to 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 be around you know just yeah. meaning you don't got to be cool just show up on time man you know yeah. what i mean show up on time uh, uh be willing to uh you know uh take direction and 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 be a part of the team you got to be a team player you have yeah. to you got to be a team player and you have to be a good listener and you got to work hard and work harder and show up on time and work harder. I think that it's just being consistent and, and word gets out. If you're working with a lot of people and putting yourself in different situations and you're playing well and you're doing it uh, without being a diva, people like that, man. Word you know gets I mean? around. Yeah. It's around. So uh, I'd say get out there and play with as many people as you possibly can, because even if it's a situation, I still do things like this. Even if it's a situation that you might not love, love, love musically, as long as you're not doing it day and night and it's sucking the soul out of you. Yeah. Go to a session, even if it's not for someone you don't love necessarily musically and is you're doing it for free. But if you're going to be around other players that might go, man, that was great. Uh, what are you doing next week? Because actually I've got something that pays pretty well. Nice. Great. Well, it might be the engineer at the studio that goes, oh man, your playing was great. And I'm involved in this other project. Let me get your phone number. It's networking, you know, so don't be too cool or too precious about yeah. gigs, especially in the beginning, you know, say so yes to as much stuff as you can, you know. Absolutely. And hey, in closing, what's the deal with P.F. Chang's, man? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Uh, it, it's been the lines have become blurred and I don't know if I'm serious or not. And it's so funny, man. It's so funny you'd say that because it's been it's been years of that. I've latched onto for, I don't know why I latched onto it. The hashtag, I, they must love you. You know, a friend of mine that's kind of doing stuff for me, helping me with my record uh, is like, I've got to get, years ago, I had a publicist contract them and they actually sent me a bunch of gift cards. They sent me like a ton of gift cards because I'm like, I'm having people like slash tweet. The, the, my big story with them is when this publicist finally reached out to them and said, you got to hook this guy up. Um, slash one day tweeted, to his like two and a half million followers, he said, why is it that I can't pass a PF Changs without thinking about Josh Freeze? I love right? it. And she sent him that like, listen, this guy's got, uh, I don't know, about 2.4 million more followers than you guys have, you know, PF Changs on their Twitter account. Like this guy's promoting you, like you can just hook him up or something. I mean, it's the like, craziest thing because in social media, it could, if it's done right, it could be a true reflection of like, you know, your character and your personality and you like, like that would not work for me. Like me what? hashtagging, you know, Whataburger. It just, it just right. would not work. Dude. I just worked it into this weird artwork that I do. And I got to tell you what, this is pretty funny because the other night on my story, I put up some weird P.F. Chang shit with like Gene Simmons with like P.F. Chang's across his face and just randomness, right? Just confusing people sort of. And I looked and I noticed that PF Chang's was like, is like looking at these posts. I go, okay, they're either stoked or they're like, you know what, dude? Can we give you some like gift certificates to stop talking about us? Because you're stop so using the hashtag. You're, you're so you're so out there that you're freaking us out. You know, yeah. I might be kind of like freaking. I don't know. You know, the I, I got to tell you the other thing that would totally not work for me, and you just totally nail it. Just your whole fashion vibe of where you mix crazy colors and you can wear button ups and shit and be a rock drummer. It's like, dude, I wear like John Vervedos black t shirts, yeah, yeah, yeah. a leather jacket. Yeah. I know it works for me, but you can wear anything. I don't know how I get, I get I, yeah, I, I'm lucky that I'm getting away with that stuff. I don't know. It's like, I guess just owning it and owning it for long enough that people are like, yeah, that's, you know. I mean, Lacoste there's, shirts there's, and there's, there's khakis. A, there's a, there's a and, shirt that I have is this. Well, yeah, I'm wearing, yeah, I'm wearing like Banana Republic, you know, khaki pants with these weird fluorescent Adidas shirt. I mean, shoes. it totally like I, works. Dude, I've stopped this girl in an airport about three weeks ago. This is a Steely Dan shirt, but it, it's a ripoff of a, a famous Sonic Youth album cover, right, from the 90s. Yeah. And this girl was walking like this, like her shirt was probably like this. And as I passed her, I'm like, dude, that looked like the Sonic Youth album cover, but I think it said Steely Dan. What the yeah. hell? And I come back around and without freaking her out in the middle of some like the airport terminal, like in Dallas or Houston or something, I stop her. I go, can I say, is that a Steely Dan shirt? She goes, yeah. I go, oh my God. I go, can I see it? She goes, sure. She like opens up. I go, where'd you get that? And she, I, actually, I already forget the name of the website. She goes, oh, blah, blah, blah. It's 
like Southern gentlemen or Wait, let me know because I want wacky t-shirts. Oh, dude, I was like, so into it. I got on the plane. I ordered it before I took off medium black Sonic youth, Steely Dan shirt sent to my house. I'm like, God bless the internet. It, right? it, but women don't like Steely Dan. They just, my wife hates them. Every girlfriend so, I've ever had just, just despises some chicks, do, some chicks do. And I'm like, I've gone to see the dang concert. I was impressed. I was sitting, standing next to this girl and her, and her boyfriend or her husband. And she's, she was youngish and she was kind of cute. And she's singing like kids, Charlemagne and, and my old school. I'm like, dude, what I would give my wife to be like that for two seconds. But it's kind of funny. It's this ongoing thing. My, it is funny to me because I love Steely Dan. My wife hates Steely Dan. But they play wineries. That might be the one to take her to, though. like at a winery. Because yeah. they do a lot of wineries. Because oh, I yeah. went to college with Keith Carlock. I mean, I was like, oh, what? Yeah. He's great. oh, yeah, he went to North Texas State, didn't he? Yeah, we were there at the same time. I was like, this kid's going to change the world. He's a badass, man. He's a badass. I love Sick. him. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me on. Yeah, man, you got to go have dinner. I'm going to go have dinner with my dad and, uh, you know, thank you. Yeah, man. The, the, so cool to finally connect. And I was like, when am I going to meet Josh in person? Cause I always go to the pro drum Hollywood Christmas party. It's, oh, right. You know, well, I'm going to, I'm, I'm in and out of town in December to, from in town this year. I'll go. They didn't really do it last year. I've only gone to a couple of them. Yeah. But uh, if I'm around, I'll definitely go. So just a minute, volume one, it's on all the streaming platforms. And if you want to get a physical copy, where do people go? Uh, you can go, I think you can, uh, it's in the link in my bio on, uh, on Instagram. You can buy it right there. Uh, I've got a new website that's going to be up in days now, but you can, if you punch in the internet, you can find the links will come up. You can have it ordered to your house within a couple minutes. You know? Fantastic. Oh uh, man. So cool to have you brother. And uh, to all the listeners out there, thank you so much. Subscribe, share, rate, review. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. We'll see ya. All right, brother. Bye. Bye-bye.